Come on, come on. Y'all know about Flavor Fest? How many of you guys have been to Flavor Fest before? Okay. And how many, like, this is, like, new to you? Flavor Fest is new to you. Okay, about half and half. It's going to be amazing. Just wait. Just wait. Well, how y'all feeling today? Y'all good? Good to see everybody. Good to be back with you guys. Thank you again for all the happy birthday wishes. A lot of birthdays in July, right? Yeah, I've been meeting all kinds of people. It's their birthday. Well, we're in this series right now talking about um, dumb things that smart Christians what? Believe, say, do, all that stuff, right? So the first week we talked about, uh, we kicked it off with talking about our conscience. And we talked about uh, let, let your conscience be your what? Your guide, right? But if we really do that, a lot of times our conscience can mess us up, right? So we had to learn that we have to have a godly conscience. Otherwise, we can get caught up in emotion, make bad decisions, right? Last week, we talked about judging. Should Christians judge? So should they? Should they? Right? In the right context, right? Because that's a a scripture that so many times is taken out of context. Like, you know, and then, of course, we live in a culture where people get so easily offended and we don't want to say anything to anyone because, oh, I don't want to say anything to Tasha because she's going to get offended if I tell her about, oh, I don't want to feel awkward. Or, you know, maybe she'll unfriend me on Facebook. We get so, we get so concerned and caught up and worried about we're going to get rejected or they're going to get offended with us. or You know, so we just walk around. We just don't say nothing. Well, I'm just going to do me. She could do her. <laughs> you know, I'm just going to do me and just whatever happens, happens. And I'll just pray about it, right? But we learned last week that as believers in Christ, we have responsibility for each other. There should be some accountability. So if we see somebody that's doing something, if I see Rio is doing some things in his life that he shouldn't be doing, I need to talk to this brother. Why? Because I care about him. You know, but on the flip side, at the same time, like when somebody comes to you that cares about you and loves you, um, you have to be open to correction. Like we have to follow that scripture that James talks about, be slow to speak and be quick to listen, right? We usually do it the other way around, right? So, you know, if Rio starts telling me something like, you know, like hey, you know, you should, oh, but did you know, like, right away you want to just jump in and defend yourself. Like, if somebody's correcting you, like, just listen and, and, and just be, be aware of it. Maybe God's using this person to speak to me. Now, sometimes those people could be totally off, right? But especially if that's somebody that knows you, that has a relationship with you, and you have some uh, relational capital, you've done life before, like we should be a little bit more open, right? There's been so many times over the years, I can't tell you the number of times where I had thought I had relational capital with someone. I mean, I really did. Like me and that person had been through some things, and man, but then when I corrected them on something, suddenly I was, man, why are you judging me? Why are you ju- I'm not judging you. <laughs> I'm doing what the scripture talks about in Corinthians. Like I'm, I'm, I'm responsible for you as my brother as my sister. So don't get caught up in the whole thing like only God can judge me, you know, just because Tupac said it. So many people, they got the tattoo, they got the t-shirt. That doesn't mean it's, that doesn't mean it's truth, right? We got to talk about what's true. So, all right. So I'm going to get off my pedestal with all the judging stuff because we already preached about that last week. Go back and watch it. Go back and watch it again. So tonight we're going to be tackling does God bring good luck? Does God bring good luck? And so here's what I want to do. I want to start out a little bit different. Usually we do response at the end. I want to start out with a little bit of response today to kind of set this up a little bit. So how many of you guys, so, so I need my microphone person to get ready. Where's my microphone person? Is that you, Lily? <laughs> sure, come on, Lily. <laughs> are, are you going to do it fast, Christopher? Okay. Like, I, I got this. I, I got this. Yeah, she don't want to do it. She's hiding over there in the dark. So, so let me ask this to the audience here. How many of you would say this year that uh, some great things have happened in your life as you've been following God? How many of y'all would say that? Okay. So, so I, I want to get like one or two people to share. This isn't like, don't give me this long testimony. Just give us a couple sentences of some things that God has done, and we can just we can celebrate that with you. So who wants to like share some stuff that's happened? So Pastor Cripps is going to come around. He's going to hold the mic, and you can just, just say your name and just share, like, like something good that God's done this year. 
Uh, my name's Janet, and one of the m- many great things that he's done for me this year is brought me to this church and this church family. And recently, I've been struggling with this job that I was at, and I actually got fired from it today. But within this day, I've gotten four interviews set up already. And that's just one of two of the many things that he's done for me so far. All right. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Who else? Who else wants to share? We've got to be fast, Pastor Christopher. (laughs) Yeah. We're going to make you get some exercise here for a minute. All right. <laughs> um, I want to thank God because uh, a couple weeks ago my mom had an unexpected heart attack and now because she's a believer and the people that were surrounding her in prayer she's doing a lot better so I know that God's hand was on it okay. throughout the whole thing good give God some praise for that alright somebody else a fellow we had two ladies is there a guy here that's like man it's been a good year there's been some good things that have happened in my life okay Coming over. We want the online crowd to be able to hear it too. Uh, real quick, I've been temping off and on for a long time, but just recently I got an opportunity to start an opportunity at 1650. My supervisor came at me last week, Friday, and said, hey, how everything's going? I said, great. Unfortunately, the salary. Monday, they gave me a dollar raise. I knew that was God. It was like, I didn't even, I mean, I prayed for it, but I didn't talk to my supervisor about it. She approached me. And it happened. I mean, within days, literally. Because we had that conversation Friday and Monday. She was like, I sent you an iMessage. She's like, oh, man, I've been busy. He's like, sit down, close the door. I got you a dollar more. I was like, well, thanks. (laughs) I I knew it was going to. All right. Awesome. Give God some praise for that. Good. All right, so now let me flip it. So we heard three good stories. Now, let me flip it tonight. Maybe you're not expecting this. I'm, I want you to be honest tonight. You don't have to get into details or whatever. Uh, but how many of you have been through some rough times this year as you have been following God? And, and if there's anybody that's willing to say, okay, this has been a rough thing that's happened to me this year. I don't even want to talk about it. Okay. I have passed. Oh, I can't even talk. Okay, I have a past that I'm not proud of. My family is, they're not where they're supposed to be, and and sad to say, but each one is dying. Like, as each year comes up, I hear or find out someone close to my family is passing away. And then my brother was dying, so I went up north literally a few months ago, and it just messed up my life completely to the point where I was homeless with my three kids. I have three little girls, and one of them was a newborn baby. And I don't have my parents. They they passed away. So it's like I'm really alone out here, and someone from my past just randomly found me and hit me up and told me, you have to leave New York now and move to Florida. I've been in Florida for nine years on and off. And when they told me to come to Florida, I told them I don't have money. I just lost my job. I'm about to be homeless. I don't know what to do. She was like, I'll pay for everything. Just get out. She knew my story. She was like, just get out. I didn't believe it. I was stubborn. I waited two more weeks. She's like, look, if I let you decide to do this, you're not going to get out. She's like, I'm booking your ticket. I'll give you the date, and you're gone. That's exactly what happened, and I've been here for five months, and this is where I'm at today. I have a house that I'll be moving to with God's help next month. I just got my car, and I just found out that my daughter's going to be an advanced student starting this year. And I signed the papers for her to be in gifted classes for the next three years. So it's been a rough year, but it's getting better. It's getting better. Awesome. Awesome. I want to pray for you in just a minute. Tell me your name again. I want to pray for you in a minute. Uh, but I want to pray for a few other people, too, 
So anybody else here that's like, yeah, this has been a rough year. Anybody else that wants to just share? Anyone who hasn't shared yet? I've battled um, anxiety and depression for years, and this past year it's been really hard. I've been seeking out counselors and medication and, and just really been trying, and the doctors put me on a lot of medication, and it's made me gain a lot of weight, and it's just, it's really been hard, and on August 2nd, I have to go see a, a psychiatrist to try to, you know, find out what medication I need to be on. I've been trying natural things as well, and it's just been, it's, re it's really been hard. Thank you for your honesty. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and pray for us, and um, pray for those of you that even just raise your hand. There was a lot of other hands that went up that said, yeah, this has been some rough things that have happened this year. It's been a challenging year. And so let's, let's pause it before we really dive into tonight's study. God, we come before you tonight. And first of all, we say uh, that you're a good God through the, through the good times, bad times, days that are amazing, and the days that are extremely difficult. And God, we saw hands go up on both sides. And there's many people that raised their hand for both things. There's been some amazing things this year. But there's been some really difficult things. And so, God, I pray for those that are looking for a job right now. Pray for those that are struggling with health issues or they have loved ones that are struggling with health issues right now. Um, God, I pray for people that are st struggling with depression, anxiety. There's so much stress and pressure that we have in this world. And at moments, it can just seem overwhelming. God, I pray tonight as we look at your word and we look at truth that we'll put on the right lenses because it's so tempting sometimes to, to put on the wrong lenses or just have selective hearing and hear the things that we want to hear, even if that's not really what's being said or not really what it means in context. So, God, just help us to, to listen to your spirit tonight as we look at your word and give me grace and wisdom as I deliver this message and as we look at these different scriptures and, uh, Father, I just um, pray for our sister that, that just moved here from New York. And, uh, God, I thank you that there's been progress. She's got a place to stay. Her kids are doing better. Thank you for the progress that is happening, God. I thank you for there's so many stories in this room and those that are worshiping online with us, stories of progress in ways that you are moving in our lives. Mountains are being moved. Miracles are happening. Uh, but then there's also other people here that are going through challenging times and even right now at this moment it might not seem like it's getting better um, but God our hope clings to we know that even if there's challenging times in this life um, that the best is yet to come we have a relationship with you God um, there's so much more than beyond the the days and the months and the years that we have on this planet and so God may we get a clearer vision tonight of the big picture and so I lift all this up to you in Jesus name everyone said Amen. So, thank you guys for your honesty. I didn't mean to start out and just, everybody breathe. All right. Over the years, there's been a lot of different people that have come here to Crossover, have attended, have, like, leaned in, and God was doing amazing things in their life, but then they went through a rough patch, and they just disappeared. And people would call them and reach out to them, and, and, but they just... They just didn't want to have anything to do with God anymore. They were just, they were done. I tried all that. That doesn't work. And so unfortunately, you know, some of those people, even they, they write me from jail. Matter of fact, in my Bible <laughs> that's over here, I usually even have some letters in there. And I got a letter in here right now that I just got the other day from a kid that was part of our youth ministry uh, many, many years ago, back when I was the youth pastor. And, um... He's in prison again. He's gotten out a couple of times, but he would come and visit and say he was going to get his life on track, but then he would just get sucked back into doing the wrong things because that was, that was easier. When he tried to do the right things, it's not working out as much, right? Well, now, you know, in the latest letter I got from him, he said, man, I'm going to be out. I'm going to be out when I'm 45. 
like, wow, you know, and he's, uh, he's a lot younger than that right now, and so it's just like, man, we see that, and it's just, ah, so the problem is, is so many of us, so many people have this idea, and we can get it from Christian books, we can get it from preaching and teaching, that God's going to bring you good luck, he'll bring you good luck, I mean, things will just automatically get better if you just get with God. It'll just, everything will begin to line up. And now, you know, because you're on the winning team and God's victorious, right? Now, all that sounds good on the surface, right? And it, and it even makes sense as we kind of look at some scripture and some of the Bible. And, and you know, but, but here, write this down in your notes. First thing to write down tonight, those of you that got your, your notes with you. And you got to listen close because this is not going to be on the screens today. Um, so write this down. God never promises us an easy life. Never promises us earthly success. But here's what he does promise. Promises forgiveness. Promises eternal life in heaven. But he never says it's going to be an easy life here. But he promises us forgiveness. Promises us eternal life in heaven. But the winning lottery numbers, a job promotion... You know, that, that dream car that you want, good health, stacks of cash, that's not necessarily like in the menu. You know, those, those things, maybe some of those things you'll get, probably not the winning lottery numbers, <laughs> but um, those things are not necessarily in the menu. The scripture, though, it does talk about carrying your cross. It does talk about being misunderstood, it does talk about being persecuted does talk about being hated by the world. It does talk about all that stuff. I'm not trying to be a downer tonight, y'all, but I'm trying to bring balance. Somebody say balance. Because so many times we just look at it through one lens. Like, man, everything's going to be great if I follow God. And then when we go through some challenging seasons, we're like, hold on, what's going on? What's wrong? Well, wait a minute. That, that wasn't the full picture. Like, there is some blessings, but there's still going to be some challenges that we go through because we're on a sin-sick earth and and so many times people are just getting with God because God's going to hook them up with something right so listen we're not the first ones to believe like this <laughs> this idea has been around uh, all throughout history misleads people it's why Job's wife calls him to curse God and told, told him to curse God and die just you know just look, look at you've had this horrendous run of bad luck just uh, you know just curse God and die on the other hand you had Job's friends and what did they do? They said, man, you must have done something wrong. I mean, look at all the stuff that's happened to you and your family. Surely you've done, come on. They, they were sitting around the campfire for days with them. They were trying to get it out of them. They were playing good cop, bad cop, and everything. If you read in Job, and they were just like, come on, man, what'd you do, bro? Fess up. Because surely this wouldn't happen to you if you were like the good person that you say you are and the good person we thought you were. There's got to be some secret sin. There's got to be something that you've done that's wrong. And so if you guys got your Bibles, let's turn to Job. Job chapter 2, and we're going to start in verse, in verse 4 and read down to verse 10. And this is actually Satan talking. Satan's having this conversation uh, with God, and, and he says to God, he says, Skin for skin, a man will give all he has for his own life. But stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones, and he'll surely curse you to your face. So this is Satan having this conversation with God, saying, yeah, I see your servant Job. And, and Job, man, he's a good dude. Um, but if you do this stuff to him, watch, he'll, he'll flip on you, God. Just, just let, let, me, let me hit him like this. You know, we've done some, a couple things, but now, now let me hit him and make him sick. And then, then he's going to curse you. So the Lord said to Satan, very well then, he's in your hands, but you must spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord, afflicted Job with painful sores uh, on the soles of his feet all the way up to the top of his head. Then Job, he took a piece of broken pottery and he scraped himself with it as he sat amongst the ashes. And here's the key part, verse 9. His wife said to him, are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. And look what he said. He said, you're talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all of this, here's a key thing. Job 
did not sin in what he said. Wow. But here's his own wife, you know, the one that he became one with, you know, his partner in life. And she's just like, just curse God and die. Just, just let it go. Man. One of the most powerful examples of pain and confusion about God um, bringing, <laughs> bringing good luck and bad luck and all those things um, is articulated in, in, in a psalm by this brother named Asap, spelled A-S-A-P-H. And so I, I think, Pastor Christopher, I think maybe the abbreviation for that is, you know, it's A-S-A-P-H. As soon as possible, heaven. Because, <laughs> like, this brother was, like, struggling. He was going through it. He's like, man, get me out of here. So let's, let's unpack Psalm 73 a little bit. And I'm actually going to read some of this in the Message Bible because I, I like the way it kind of jumps out. I got my parallel Bible here, NIV and Message and, and so I'm going to start reading in, in, in chapter 73. It says this. He said, he wrote this, A-S-A-P-H, acid. He said, no doubt about it, God is good. All right, so help me out. Y'all with me all way tonight? God is what? Okay, all right. He's good to good people. He's good to the good hearted. But I nearly missed it. Miss seeing his goodness. I was looking the other way looking to the people at the top, envying the wicked who have made it, who have nothing to worry about, not a care in the whole wide world, pretentious with arrogance. They wear the latest fashions in violence. They're pampered. They're overfed. They're decked out in silk bows of silliness. They jeer using words to kill. They bully with their way with their words. They're full of hot air. Loud mouths, disturbing the peace. People actually listen to them. Can you believe it? Like thirsty puppies, they lap up their words. Does anybody ever think that about some of the artists that are out? Maybe that's just me because I'm an artist and I'm like, people like that? They spit nonsense. Anyways, all right. So what's going on here? Is, is God out to lunch? I like the way the message Bible says it. <laughs> Nobody's tending the store. The wicked get by with everything. They've made it, piling up riches. I've been stupid to play by the rules. What has it gotten me? It's gotten me a long run of bad luck. That's what. A slap in the face every time I walk out the door. If I'd given in and talked like this, I would have betrayed your dear children. Still, when I tried to figure it out, all I got was a headache. Wow. That's some honesty right there, right? Did some of y'all know that's in the Bible? He's talking to God here saying, like, all this stuff, like, look at these wicked people. They're balling out of control, not a care in the world. They're healthy. They're good. But yet, like, my family is having a heart attack. We're struggling. We're going through this. I'm wrestling with depression. I lost my job today. I'm feeling this way. I'm going through this, right? Y- y'all feel what I'm saying? That, that's what he's saying right here. Like, but look at those people on the top. They look like they don't have a care in the whole wide world. So, so what's going on? But see, here's the key thing, y'all. The key thing is that this brother here, Asap, he sought God, and he tried to look for understanding. A lot of us don't do that all the time. A lot of us just pff, forget it. We'll go out and try to cover up the pain with some of the stuff that we just talked about on Sunday, right? Might smoke something, drink something, pop a pill, because we just don't want to deal with it. We don't really want to seek truth. I mean, we do, but we don't want to do the work to put that in. And it, sometimes it takes too long, because I want to know right now, because everything's just at the touch of our fingertips, right? We're so impatient nowadays. We can get stuff right away. Uh, I'll just Google it. <laughs> or I'll just ask Siri, and, you know, so we just get impatient, but, but not, not ASAP. He went straight to God, and he waited for the answer until he found it. So look at the the next part of the scripture here. It says this. Again, he said, when I tried to understand all this, it was oppressive to me. I'm picking up in verse 17. I'm going to switch back to the NIV. And he said this, until I entered the sanctuary of God. You see that? So he entered the sanctuary of God. He went to church. He went to the temple. He went to seek God. He said, and then... I understood their final destiny. 
It's all these people he's looking at like, man, look at all the stuff they got. They got it made. Why can't, why, why aren't I getting all that? But then he went in God's presence and God began to reveal like, oh, you want some of that? Okay, this is what's going to happen. And so surely you will place them on slippery ground and you will cast them down to ruin. How suddenly they'll be destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. As a dream when one awakes, so when you arise, O oh Lord, you will despise them as fantasies. When my heart was grieved and my spirit was embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. I was a, a brute beast before you, yet I am always with you. You hold me. You, you hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterwards you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? Whom ha have I in heaven but you? Like saying, like, I don't want to go to heaven unless you're there, right? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart, they might fail. The way that the, the message Bible says, when my skin sags and my bones get brittle, <laughs> God is rock firm and faithful. Look, those who left you are falling apart. Deserters, they'll never be heard from again. But I'm in the very presence of God. Oh, how refreshing it is. I've made the Lord God my home. God, I'm telling the world what you do. Wow. So see, he went and seek God's presence. He went to say, God, wh why is all this happening? And he got an answer. So let me say tonight, like, seek God if you're looking for answers. And you might not get it in five seconds or five minutes or even five hours or five days. Um, but seek God. He'll speak to you. He'll reveal some things to you. Get around some godly counsel, not just anybody, because Y'all know you can always find the answer you want to get from somewhere, right? There's always a website or somebody out there that will want to agree with your viewpoint so you can reason yourself out of something, even if you know it's not right. But here's this guy, ASAP, and he seeked God, and he found, okay, it might look like these people that aren't following you are doing great, but in the end, like, they're going to lose everything, and then I'm going to be with you in eternity in heaven. So, again, it's understandable why a lot of us assume being on God's side can bring us good luck, can bring us success. And we have lots of people that get with God and they come to church um, because they want things to get better right here on earth, right? Let's be honest. A lot of us came to church because of that, right? Maybe initially, like, man, I'm going through some stuff right now. And if I go to church, maybe I'll feel better. Maybe God will help me out. And he's, he does and he can and all those things. Um, but we have to be careful because this can form um, a cultural Christianity. Write this down. Cultural Christianity doesn't work. It doesn't work. So what, I, what do I mean by cultural Christianity? So let me give you a, let me give you a couple examples here uh, because it can create this, you know, where it's rituals, it's symbols that people abide by, but nobody really believes. Nobody really follows Jesus. So, so let me give you some examples. How many of you know somebody that wears a cross, but they don't really follow God? Right? Not saying it's wrong to wear a cross. I see a couple crosses right here. <laughs> right? Um, how many of y'all know somebody that they might say they go to church and they might say things about God all the time, but then you hear their mouth is filled with profanity and gossip and negativity, right? Yeah. How many of y'all know somebody that their Facebook wall, they put up spiritual things one day? And then the next day, it's like stuff that's totally opposite. Anybody know that person? I got some friends like that. I pray for them. Like, man, are you bipolar? Like, yesterday you were quoting, like, you know, this preacher. You know, today, you're, what, what is that? All kinds of profanity on there and everything. Like, really? Like, wow, okay. That's cultural Christianity. People that say they believe in God, but everybody can see right through that. It doesn't fool anybody. Certainly doesn't fool God. Right. And some of us, we might have been there before as well. I mean, you check out the Israelites in many parts of the Old Testament. What did they do? They had a form of godliness, but their hearts were far from them. So maybe they would show up at the temple on Sunday. They would bring, you know, some kind of sacrifice, feel they're doing their duty. But then all week they're worshiping other gods. 
You know, they're, they're disobeying the commandments. They're doing things they totally know they shouldn't do. And you know what? We still have that going on today. You know, there's people that will show up at church on Sunday. You know, not at the re-up, the re-up or the real, the real believers here. <laughs> no. So they'll show up at church on Sunday or even Wednesday. But then the rest of the week, they're, they're worshiping other stuff by what they watch, what they listen to, what they get involved with, the way that they talk, the things that they do, the way that they treat people. And so it's just a cultural Christianity. Like, yeah, I go to church, but there's not really any real life change. There's not any real personal relationship with Jesus. This kind of becomes this ritual, this routine. So, so some people will say, well, then, well, then Pastor Tommy, why, why bother following God if your life is not going to get better and there's, there's not going to be blessings? Okay, so, so write this down. Here's the bottom line, y'all. Write this down in your notes. The benefits of righteous of righteousness, they're not primarily found in earthly rewards. They're not primarily found in earthly rewards right here on this planet. They're found in the next life. Somebody say next life. Found in the next life. So the great benefit is forgiveness, but the great reward is heaven. The great benefit is forgiveness. Jesus forgives you and me for all the dirt that we've done. And then the benefit is we get to go to heaven someday. Like, that's the hope that we cling to beyond this sin, sil, sin sick world, sin-filled world, all those things. So er- everything else that we get here is just, just hors d'oeuvres. It's just like a little bit of appetizers before the great feast that we're going to have in heaven someday. So, so some of the good things that you guys shared, because there was many people that had praise reports, man, that's just appetizers. Like, the stuff that God is going to do someday when we get into eternity is going to blow our minds, y'all. And all the struggle and the pain and the issues you went through here and the depression or the, the pressure, all the things you wrestled with and people you lost and people betrayed you, all that stuff, it's going to feel like a distant memory. Like in a moment, you're going to be like, oh, wow. Okay, that's gone. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is eternity now. This is what's going to happen for this, the rest of eternity. So when many people try to figure out whether – Following the Lord is worth the cost. You ever try to do that? I'm a numbers guy. You, you try to calculate things, right? Like, you know, they're putting the wrong benefits many times into the equation. They're trying to plug in earthly where they should be plugging in eternal. You feel what I'm saying? Like, okay, if I follow God, like, it, well, what's going to happen? Like, you're, you're looking at it all wrong because it's not about what happens here. There will be some blessings here and some benefits here. Absolutely. But the real rewards, the real ROI, return on investment, <laughs> that's an eternity. That's going to happen like in the forever. So, you know what, yet it's interesting that when a lot of times when people share their faith, we, we, in the church world we call it evangelism. Um, many times evangelism solely, it kind of just focuses on the earthly benefits that you get. So, you know. Like, hey, Danny, man, you know, you should come to church. You should get with the Lord because, you know, then, man, like, you're, you're going to experience freedom. And, like, everything's going to, like, start working out better in your marriage. And, you know, this is going to happen. That's going to happen. And, and, you know, and will some of those things happen? Yeah, probably they will. But, but yet we just focus on the earthly things. And, and we're, like, that's going to close the deal. And we're not talking about eternity. And we're not talking about what happens in the next life, because the Lord, man, he's worth, he's worth the cost. But all this stuff here is just it's temporary. So, for instance, let me, let me show you what we can do sometimes, even biblically. So a classic evangelism tool, people can use it, kind of this thing, you know, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. That sounds good, right? Sounds good, especially when your life is not going so wonderful. Like, God loves you. He's got a wonderful plan for your life. Man, if you talk to certain people on certain days, they're like, man, I need some of that. Now, here's the thing. That's true. It's, I'm, I'm not saying any of that's not true. And, of course, then, you know, maybe they'll go ahead and quote, like, John 3, 16, which most of us know, right? Most popular verse in the Bible, God so loved the world, gave his only son. Okay, y'all got different translations going on. So. But y- y'all know that verse, like, God loves you, man. He loves the world. He gave Jesus for you. You can have everlasting dads. It's great. You know, and then a lot of times they'll, they'll quote John 10, 10. 
And John 10.10 10 says, um, it says this. <clears throat> it says, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. That's the second part of it, right? So people are like, man, abundant life. That sounds good. Like we can think in America immediately like that means like wealth probably. That means success, abundant life. That means I got, like, everything I need or I got, like, excess. Like, man, that sounds good. I, I, want, I want me some of that abundant life, right, so we can hear that. But, but in context, it's not just talking about the life here really at all. In context, I want to actually read this in the Message Bible, the way it kind of breaks it down, and it says this. Because the part right before it talks about the thief. How many of y'all know who the thief is? Satan. And it says, a thief is only there to steal, kill, and destroy. But I came so that you can have real and eternal life, more and better life than they ever dreamed of. So I think the message Bible even kind of, that translation kind of hits the nail on the head. Like, it says eternal life. So it's really, it's talking about salvation. It's not just saying, hey, you can have your best life now. <laughs> Pastor Chris, we talked about that last week. But it's saying like, man, I, I've come to bring salvation so you can have eternal life, so you can have real life. Even if you struggle in your life here, it's still now going to be real life because your eyes are opened and you're looking forward to the best is yet to come and you're going to have eternity in heaven. So, so what am I saying here, y'all? What am I saying? Because I don't want you to kind of kind of miss the context. Here's what I'm saying, y'all. I'm not saying God won't bless your life here, because many times he does. And I can stand up here and give you all kinds of testimonies and blessings, and we shared some great ones in the beginning of service. I've had some great things happen to me in 2018, some unexpected things that I could just point to God and say, man, thank you, God. Look, I didn't deserve that. Look what you did, God, right? So God's hand's been on my life in many ways, lots of blessings. But at the same time, we can't ignore the teachings of Jesus that talk about hardships, that talk about persecution, talk about self-sacrifice. And we live in this entitlement culture where we don't like sacrifice. We like convenience. We like ease. I mean, that's what the culture is all about. For us, they, they, they're trying to make everything easy for us, right? Of course, they're trying to sell something to, to us and get our money, but everything's supposed to be easier. I mean, there is an app for almost everything now, right? There's an app to make your life easier. You know, my car broke down, and I, I, I took an Uber here. And the lady was like, yeah, I do Uber Eats too, you know. Like, th they'll just deliver the food right to you. They'll pick you right up. Like, there's all these things that will, like, make themselves so convenient. And so what does that do? It just kind of makes us a little bit more and more entitled if we're not careful and so if anything's hard or difficult, like, man, we don't even want to think about it. We don't want to go there. We don't want to talk about that. So, but remember, we live in a sin-filled world, and bad things are going to affect us at times. They just are. God's protection is on us, but sometimes things are going to affect us. It affected Job, and he was probably more godly than you and me put together, right? He didn't curse God when all that stuff, hey, man, he had, like, poison ivy on steroids, if that happened to me, I'd be like, God, what are you doing? Why is this, you know, and we're quick to complain, right? But he was just like, nah, it's, it's all good. Told his wife, like, listen, we, if God blesses us and gives us the good, we got to be able to take the times we go through trouble as well. I'm just being real. I don't know if that would have been my response after my kids got killed. I got this, you know, poison sumac or whatever it was that he had. Like, he's scraping himself, sitting in ashes, like, I mean, man, that was, that was a man of God, right? But God will take us through those times because many times we grow through the hard times. If we have the right posture and the right attitude and we have the right lenses on, right? So to be clear, I'm not saying you got to look over your shoulder all the time and, you know, oh, man, bad things are going to happen. No, not at all. I'm, I'm super optimistic. Christianity is not about doom and gloom or anything like that. Um, not at all. Properly understood, I mean, Christianity is this following Jesus, is this faith-filled journey that's full of hope and joy. How many of y'all have experienced some of that hope and joy? Yeah. Last night, me and my wife, we, we went to the uh, college Bible study last night. 
and there was a, a couple dozen young adults that were there, and, you know, they're going through the book of Revelations. I got to share last night, and, but it's just amazing because the majority of all those students, they weren't even around at Crossover just a few months ago, and several of those students are brand new in their walk with Jesus. As a matter of fact, on Sunday, uh, myself and Pastor Christopher had the, the honor to baptize four of them, and man, they are excited, like, talking to some of the girls last night, and she was like, yeah, you know, I've been telling everybody, you know, you know, and I'm getting everybody to come to church with me. Every Man, I, I bring a crew every Sunday. Like, I just make them come with me. I'm like, if you want to hang out with me, you got to go to church. Meet me at church, you know. And there was another girl that was there with her, and she's like, yeah, she's right, because she brought me three weeks ago. And, I, and if you would have told me I would be in church, I would have said, no way. But I've been coming every week now, and I love it. And, and like, she was like, man, God, man, I don't know how you guys know what we're thinking, but you speak to us every time, you know, and it was just amazing. There was this joy and this zeal that these new believers had, and they're finding this, this, this joy and this hope that sometimes us that have been Christians for a while, we can kind of forget about, we get caught up, and right, but it was, it was awesome to see that. So righteous living, it often does bring great rewards in this life. I know a lot of us, we got stories, we got testimonies. The book of Proverbs, a.k.a. the book of wisdom, written by King Solomon, wisest dude, richest dude that ever lived, and, and he shares this. So write this down. Righteous living generally brings stellar results. Come on, somebody say generally. Generally, that's a key, key word there, right? So in context, here's the key here, is that Proverbs are not promises. And we can get that mixed up. When we read the scripture, we can look at the Proverbs and we can say, oh, man, well, that, well, wait a minute. There's an example in my life. That didn't happen. Here's what Proverbs are. They're God-inspired statements about how life generally works. So the bottom line is this, y'all. While righteous living many times does bring incredible results, stellar results even, right, doesn't always. There's no guarantee. There's not. There is many promises in the Bible that God gives, lots of promises, forgiveness and eternal life and all those things, but Proverbs are not necessarily like promises of God. Um, they're God-inspired statements that talk about generally, if you live this way, this is what happens. But sometimes we can point to the, some of the Proverbs and the exact opposite will happen, at least for a little while. It might end up swinging back the other direction, right, as time goes on. Um, but yeah, so, so I, I could guarantee you this, though. Tough times will happen in your life. I can guarantee you this, some good times will happen too. But they're not always going to happen in the same order and in, in, in the same in a row, right? Last year was an incredible, incredible year for me. My wife, my kids, church. I could point to so many good things that happened in 2017. But at the same time, um, that year, I watched my mother die to cancer. And I watched her physically deteriorate. And that was one of the hardest things I ever had to do in my life. I mean, it was just grieving, right, to see my mom, who was earlier in the year, was, was still pretty much normal. She had cancer, but she was able to function and drive her car and get around and go to church and, you know, and to the point of where she couldn't even get out of bed anymore. And it just, you know, man, that was a tough, tough year. I heard, I heard Pastor Rick Warren Make, make this illustration, which really spoke to me. I was in a small group of, of pastors as he shared this one time, and he said, you know, a lot, of, a lot of people will say life is full of ups and downs, right, like a roller coaster. You've all heard that before, right? He said, I don't really like that illustration. I think a better illustration is life is kind of like train tracks. You've got two rails, and one rail represents the good things in life, and the other rail represents the challenging things in life, the bad things in life. And at any given time of your life, those two tracks are running parallel next to each other, right? Now, some seasons of your life, there's more good stuff happening than bad stuff. And then there's other seasons that are happening in life that there is more bad stuff happening than good stuff. But at any given time, you can still, even if it, the good stuff is ruling and there's more of that, you can still point to a few bad things, right? Okay, so things are going really good. Oh, but this thing, this person at my job is still, you know, 
or maybe things are really bad right now overall, and it just seems like a mess, but there's still, you know what, man, God is still faithful in this area. I've still been able to pay my bills. I've still been able to keep my kids in this school. Or, or you know, there's, so any time there's this. So he said those, those two tracks are going to always be parallel next to each other. The key thing is who's driving your train. Because whoever is driving your train in the driver's seat is going <laughs> to help you have the balance so you don't go off the tracks. And a lot of us, that's good, right? A lot of us, we've, We've gone off the tracks before because we've gotten so unbalanced where things were so bad that we just went off the tracks and it was a mess. Or we've been through some other times, some of us can maybe admit that things were so good that we also went off the tracks. We didn't need God anymore and we indulged in stuff because everything seemed to be smooth and it was all right and and we stopped going to church and we didn't really need God because everything was, so it can happen either way, right? We need to have that balance, and we need to make sure who's in the driver's seat. Not us, but if we say, God, I'm going to give my life to you. Jesus, you gave your life to me. So that's what being in a relationship with Jesus is. It's when we submit our life to him and say, Jesus, here's my life. Now, you're the Lord of my life. You know what Lord means? It means leader. So saying, you're the leader. You're you're the one driving the train. (laughs) You're the one in control. I'm the co-pilot. You know, they say, Jesus is my co-pilot. He ain't my co-pilot. He's the pilot, right? And, and I'm the co-pilot. I'm just, you know, hanging out like he's the one that, that's running things. So think about it like that. So tonight I'm here to tell you, yeah, there's going to be many seasons. God's going to open up doors. He's going to give you supernatural favor. Miracles are going to happen that you can't explain, right? But I want to remind you it's not always like that. So don't set yourself up to think like, you know, it's going to be like that all the time because then you're setting yourself up for the enemy to whisper things in your ear against God's goodness and against his, judge, his judgment, his justice. So write this down. Unrealistic expectations never make for solid footing. Unrealistic expectations never make for solid footing. And I mean, and that could be in so many categories, right? That could be your marriage. It could be a purchase that you just made could be a business partner it could be a vacation but especially like your your walk with your creator god right if you have unrealistic expectations man um it's gonna be a recipe for confusion it's gonna be a recipe for disaster disillusionment all that stuff right so let people know from the jump let them know like god has an eternal reward for you if you follow him it's gonna be amazing and there's some blessings here too on this earth, but you're still going to go through some things. There's still going to be some tough things. Matter of fact, when you first get with God, sometimes it's going to be harder. Did anybody experience that? There's like a little bit of a learning curve, and you got to like stop doing some of the other things and disconnect from some people and disconnect maybe even from some habits and some places and maybe even some illegal money streams that you had. Oh, and that happens in all kinds of ways. But when you disconnect from some of that, sometimes it doesn't always come back right away when you're living righteous. And it's real hard at first. I'll say many times it'll get easier because God will, as you get into this new rhythm and, you know, your heart becomes more like his, you know. But it's challenging sometimes. That's when a lot of people fall off. That's when, uh, as we were reading this book, um, Pastor Christopher talked about that thins the herd. <laughs> that's he's, that, that shows who the real people really are. Because a lot of times you just have these people that are jumping on the bandwagon because they want something from God. Because you think about it, where's the place in the world that the church is the strongest? It's in the places of persecution. You go to the Middle East, you go to places in Asia and China, in places in Africa where there's persecution on the church, those people are serious. Those people go hard. Those people have all-night prayer meetings. Those people be in church all day. I mean, this, this evangelist told me about when he went to Africa, he said the people would be out in the middle of the sun, no shade, just sitting out on these benches, on these little chairs that they made, thousands and thousands of them sitting in the sun all day, just listening to preaching hours and hours. they take a few breaks, have a few meals, and then they have church at night. He said, man, they would go till 1, 2, 3 o'clock in the morning just having church out in the middle of a field with bugs and everything, thousands of people. 
Like, man, just worshiping God. Like, we never do that. We're too civilized for that. It's too hot. Like, man, we can't, you know, like, man, we get upset if the air conditioning ain't working enough. Somebody took our favorite seat, you know. Like, man, took our parking spot. Pastor T didn't shake my hand. Oh, the line was too long, man. He didn't look my way. I was trying to get his attention, man. <laughs> he got ADD. I don't know what's wrong with that, Pastor. So at the end of the day, here's this, y'all. I'm going to wrap it up, and we'll do some Q&A. Um, and, and I want to pray again as well tonight. But if we don't have a balanced look at God, we can simply turn him into a good luck charm. That's what we can, that's what we can end up doing. We, we, can, we can kiss our cross, right? We can do the little symbol of the cross, you know. Some of y'all did that back in the day. <laughs> you can wear your Christian T-shirt, you know. This is my good luck Christian T-shirt right here. I've never washed it before. That's because it's new. Darnell got it for me. So, but listen, don't whittle God down to a ritual or a symbol or a T-shirt, right? He wants to be part of our everyday life in a very, very real way. Even when things are going well even when things are challenging. So, so listen, y'all, I'm an optimist. Like, I know tonight was a little heavy and a little light, but I'm an optimist. Man, I'm a dreamer, a visionary. God gives me dreams. God gives me visions. You know, I'm excited for here on earth and for eternity. And so my mindset is like, you know, even if I don't get to do some of the things I'm dreaming about here, man, I got all of eternity to do that. And I know some of the things that God is setting me up for here, maybe you've never thought of this before, so some of the areas that you're learning about here, you're getting knowledge and even experience in, and maybe you're never going to be able to fully live that out. It's not for here. It's for eternity. I know there's going to be things I'm going to be doing in, in eternity that are going to look very different than what I did here on earth. But it's some of the things on the side that I have passions for that I wasn't able to fully maybe live out here because this is just a warm-up act, y'all. Miss B is the dress rehearsal, you know, like the big show is up in eternity, like forever, and it's going to be beautiful, it's going to be incredible, and that's when we get our full rewards, and when we'll be in the presence of God in paradise, like forever, so I know today there might be some big challenges, some big mountains in front of you right now, whatever you're facing, but man, keep your hope and your eyes on eternity, because that's what really matters, you know, so I want to pray for you guys tonight. Father, we love you tonight, and God, first of all, I just want to say for all of us, myself included, forgive us. Forgive us, God, for the times that we complain, the times that we take you for granted, the times that we're ungrateful, and we have so much compared to so many other people on this planet. We're, we're so blessed in so many ways. People would dream most people on this planet would dream to be in the positions that we're in and the potential to have the opportunity that we have. But many times we complain and we squander it and we just wallow in self-pity sometimes. So first of all, God, I just want to say we're sorry for the times we overlook how good you are to us. At the same time, God, um, it is reality that we live on a sin-sick planet Ever since Adam and Eve ate of that fruit, there's been all kinds of heartache and disaster and all kinds of issues and heaviness and things are not as you meant them to be. But God, we thank you for your son, Jesus. And because of him, because of us having that opportunity to be forgiven because of what he did on the cross, his work on the cross, his atonement, that he died for our sins in our place. And it didn't end there. He resurrected three days later. And because of that now, we can have a relationship directly. The veil was torn. We don't have to go through a mediator, a third person, a, a priest, a pastor. Like, we can come directly to you and talk to you anytime. Anytime we have full access. VIP availability. That's what you did for us, Jesus. And we thank you for it. And help us not to take it for granted. Help us to use it every day. Help us to spend time with you. And God, help us when we go through our hard times. Because we are on a sin-filled planet. And there's many people that don't know you. And there's systems that are corrupt. And 
there's just all kinds of things that we're facing. It can be challenging at times. I'm not making that a small thing. There's a lot of us that are in some very real challenges and some things that we're up against right now. And so, God, give us, give us strength. Give us your grace. Give us wisdom. But, God, help us to hold on to your hope that this isn't the end. This is just this is the hors d'oeuvres. This is the appetizers before the feast. And so, God, I pray for each person here right now that's struggling with some stuff, that's going through some things. I'm lifting them up one more time tonight, God. I pray that they'll walk out of here and they will feel encouraged, but at the same time, all of us will walk out of here with a little bit better of an understanding of Scripture and the full picture, the big picture, that everything's not always going to be perfect. It's not always going to be great, but that's okay. Because after this life and the next life, we're going to get our full rewards. That's what we hold on to. That's what we hope for. And God, help us not to miss out on the mission and the plan and the destiny that you have for us while we're here on this earth. It's a short time, but help us to max it out and do everything that we're called to do. Help our church to do everything that we're called to do here in Tampa, in Atlanta, all the people that we're touching online, the ministry that we do uh, that even reaches beyond the borders of this country, God. Um, help us as we continue to grow in those areas, and we're the light for you. So we pray this in Jesus' name. Everyone said, amen. Amen. Give God some praise tonight. Yeah. I know tonight was, uh, was a little bit uh, of a heavy topic, but um, we still have a couple of minutes. I got done nice and early. It's uh, 8, 16, 8, 17 right now. So if there's a couple of, couple of questions, I just felt like I wanted to pray and bring closure at that point. Um, but if there's any other questions anybody has, We'll bring the mic over so the people online can also can also hear. Anybody? Right. Sorry. Um, I heard that. Well, they told me that it was wasn't right to be optimistic or um, superstitious or anything like that. I know so much superstitious. I heard it was true, but they said it wasn't good to be optimistic, and I kind of am like that, so am I wrong for being like that? Well, superstitious and optimistic are definitely two different, they're two different things. So superstitious, I would say, yeah, you don't need to be superstitious. That usually kind of is attached to some other belief system or faith system or some kind of ritual or symbol that's... I really believe in other things, so yeah. that's why I keep yeah. myself away and I ask that question. Sure, but optimistic... That means you, you basically, you have a positive outlook on what's next, on the future. And I think that believers should be optimistic about the future, absolutely. Uh, like Pastor Christopher even said last week, you know, about this trending thing that people are saying now, man, I'm living my best life now. Um, I'm not living my best life now because I'm, I'm living in my walk with Jesus, and I'm, I'm believing that greater things are coming, not only in this world, but even especially beyond this world. So I'm super optimistic, and I know that God has his hand upon my life, and there's some things happening, and things happening in our church, and what we're doing together as a body. So I believe that there is better days ahead, absolutely. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely optimistic, and I think believers should be. I think that people tell us maybe you shouldn't be optimistic because they're, um, they got a different lens on they're negative. They're looking at all the bad things. If you watch the news, oh, yeah, you can definitely be not optimistic. And there's been moments in my life I got caught up in that. You know, I've, I've had people that would get caught up in conspiracy theories. And Pastor Christopher, they would tell me that the world is going to end in a few months. Watch out. You know what I'm saying? And so you just got to gotta be careful who you're around sometimes and what you listen to because you can't get influenced by that. And if you watch too much of the news, like, it can get depressing. And you can feel like the world is going to end. And many times in media, they feed on fear. And if they can get you to be afraid, if they can get you to be afraid of people that are a different race or people that have guns or people that have a certain flag or all those kind of things like, oh, my gosh, the whole world's falling apart. Is there bad things happening? Yes, absolutely. But we have this 24-hour news cycle now. We have social media. And that's just highlighting stuff that's been there already anyways. 
So it might feel like it's worse, but a lot of that stuff has been there anyways, right? So just be careful because it's real easy that we can just get caught up in media and social media and different around different people, and we can just get real negative and real pessimist. That's the opposite of optimist, right? So, all right, awesome. Um, not a question, but just a comment. In the beginning of the year, I made a vision board, and I um, told God that I wanted to trust him in the good and the bad, and that I wanted to just, like, not be doubting this year. And with that being said, of course, the enemy was attacked me at everything. The worst thing that I ever um, I feared to ever happen, happened. And in that moment, I was reminded that I made that, um, that I wanted to be wanted to be able to trust him. And so right then, even as sad as I was, as hurt as I was, and I just told him that I don't know what you're doing, but I trust you. And in that moment, like, I got a peace. And that doesn't mean that everything is all right, and there's still things I had to work out, but there's a peace that I can't explain. And it is, he says that in the Bible. And I just wanted to say that for whoever might be just going through that because he will give you a peace to endure that. It's good, dude. Thank you. Peace that passes understanding. We don't understand it, but God can give it to us and we can have a totally different outlook on what's happening, even though nothing has technically changed yet, right? All right. Got a couple more. Thank you. Um, I uh, was given this scripture, and I wanted to ask uh, your, um, in, you know, per interpretation, you being the, the leader, um, our shepherd. Um, it's Psalms 127, uh, 2. It said, it is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he, God, uh, gives uh, uh, gives his beloved sleep. Now, I work overnight. I was actually given this um, scripture earlier so this Psalm morning. What? Psalm Psalms one twenty seven, uh, verse two. Okay. Um, and while I was working, I was g given this scripture by one of uh, my passengers because I'm that's the Lyft driver. Um, and uh, I work overnight. And I have insomnia, you know, that's another reason why I do that. And um, he was mentioning about, you know, basically he was saying it as if that, you know, God doesn't want you to be up all night worrying or, or up working. I'm, I'm not confused. I basically want to kind of get your opinions. <laughs> like, am I sinning because I'm working overnight because I'm up because I can't sleep? No, no. Again, everybody say context. Because you always got to read what is happening before and what's happening after, you know, versus looking at one verse. So this is a, a, a psalm that, that Solomon wrote. And it says, it, you know, in the verse 1, it says, unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labor in, in vain. Everybody say in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen stand guard in vain. You know, it says, in vain you rise early, you stay up late, toiling for food to eat, for he grants sleep to those that he loves. So, in essence there, you know, and you could keep reading after that, but in essence he's saying that if you are not following God, if he's not in your life, uh, if you're doing things in your own strength and your own will and your own power, then it's in vain. You need to trust God for those things. You need to include him. So when you're building your house, include the Lord. You know, write some scriptures down on that floor, you know, on the wall. Hang some scriptures up, right? It says, unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen that are standing guard, it's in vain. You know, so you need to be praying and saying, God, protect our city, protect our house. Like, you, they could be standing there with a gun, but there could be 20 people that come with guns, and then it really doesn't matter. God is ultimately the, the protector. So in that vein, that word vein, right? In that vein, um, then it moves on and it says in that verse you're talking about, in vain you rise early. You stay up late, toiling for food to eat. So if you just look at that right there, it's saying um, if you rise early in your own strength or you stay up late in your own strength because you're trying to hustle to get food to eat, then it's in vain. And it's saying there in the, in the last part of it, it's saying, for he grants sleep to those he loves. Meaning, like, he's going to provide for you. 
He's going to take care of you. He's going to, but if, if you need to go do Uber in the middle of the night and God is with you and you're trusting him and he's led you to go do that and he's going to protect you, you know, you know that, that's not like, oh, you shouldn't go work at night or you shouldn't get up too early because there's many parts of the scripture where it does say you should rise early. You know, you should spend time with the Lord. You, but again, in context, it has those two words in vain. So if you're doing that in your own strength and you're not doing it for the glory of God, that's when, you know, you're going to be lost. I'm going to pray that God will give you some rest and give you some peace of mind, you know, because there's obviously some stuff that's going on in your mind, even in your body, and, you know, and God can't give you rest, and God can use, that doesn't mean he doesn't love you just because you're having problems sleeping, um, but there's obviously some things that are going on, and we could talk more about that, you know, offline as well, so we'll take, we'll take one uh, more. I just want to say to her. Go uh, ahead. That, um. Don't get hung up on sleep because that's a metaphor that's used to say God's going to take care of you, period. He, that, that word sleep, he, he says he's going to, he, don't do all these things in vain. He's going to take care of you. So don't think, don't get hung up on sleep, the word sleep. It's just a part of, of the way Solomon wrote in metaphors to say, look, all this stuff might be happening, but God is going to take care of you. Day, night, afternoon, doesn't matter. That's good. That's good. Pastor Christopher, you want to add anything? All right, let's go ahead and pray. And uh, I'm going to pray one more time. I know we prayed. I feel like we got to pray one more time and all. End it out. Father, we thank you uh, again for these questions. We thank you for your word. Thank you for context. And God, we don't want to do things in vain, our own strength, our own energy, our own willpower. We want to lean on you. We want to be involved in the details of our life and everything. It, it matters to you. Sometimes we can feel like you're so big and you're so great. You have so many other people to worry about. Our little problems, our little things don't matter to you. But as we look at your word, that's not the truth. You care about the details of our life, even what we worry about. And God, help us to cast our cares upon you and not worry. And like Dietrich talked about, give us that peace that passes understanding so our minds can rest, so you can take care of things. And then even practically, so we can get rest tonight and sleep even. And so, God, I pray for anybody that's, that's wrestling with uh, having issues with not being able to sleep. Um, God, I pray you're going to give them rest. I pray even if there's, you know, different changes they need to have in their diet or their rhythm. Sometimes there's practical things that you can put in our path that can help us um, to, to rest better. Maybe we need to stop drinking coffee or whatever it is. Uh, there can be different things that can be trigger points, God, uh, that can kind of take us, take us out of our regular rhythm. And so, God, we believe in the practical and we believe in the supernatural. And, God, as those two come together, God, give us wisdom and guidance as we, as we go, as we live our lives, as we um, work this week, as we lead our families and love our children. Um, God, be with us and help us to be a light to the people that are around us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you guys. We're letting out like one minute early, so turn and say what's up to somebody. If you don't know the person next to you, say hello to them. God bless you guys that are worshiping online with us. We'll see you guys on Sunday.